So, so far we've uh, talked at length about how to actually do machine learning and some of the practicalities of, of writing us in the Waltham language. Um, let's talk a little bit now about what's going on behind the scenes. And uh, this is more important when, as you start getting involved in more complex examples. Now, all of the methods that we've talked about essentially work on numbers. And the fact that I could give it pictures or strings uh, or other kinds of input is all just part of the automation. So what actually happens uh, behind the scenes is illustrated a little bit more by this diagram here, that when we give it training data, it goes through a process called encoding. And the encoder's job is to turn whatever our input is into a vector of numbers. And once you've got this vector of numbers, then we go through the training process that makes the model. And then when we use it, the input is put through exactly the same encoding process in order to make a vector, and the vector is put through the model to make a new vector that represents the class or the output. And then that goes through a decoding step in order to actually turn it into the, the prediction that we see. So while all of the examples we've seen so far try and do their very best to automate this process of encoding and decoding, that is something where there are choices to be made, and, and those choices can be used to either magnify or control the, the way the predictors work to either accentuate features that you care about or to ignore features that you know are irrelevant. So let's go into a little bit more depth in the encode-decode process. So there are actually two parts to it, and I'm going to start with the, the, the simplest bit first, which is just turning that into a vector. And the key idea here is that uh, there is some mapping between the two, uh, between inputs and, and outputs. And the simplest, for example, if I take a string like a large cat, is a character encoding. Basically, it's the ASCII numbers, although they've been shifted down so that uh, they start at a, at a sensible number, ignoring the kind of invisible hidden characters. But we've got a mapping here that so we can see that uh, the letter A is in position 4 and next to last, and you can see in position 4, the 68 corresponds to the 68 in the other A. So we're just mapping letter by letter. But another way you could think about that is these aren't in, in individual letters. That might be important if we were doing things like spell correction as a, as a task. We might think of them as words. So here, this net encoder tokens is taking exactly the same string, but this time it's turning it into a vector of just three that represents uh, effectively the words. So you can imagine if we had a large dictionary here that, uh, that large is the 19,680th word in the dictionary. And that's the kind of mapping that it, that it has. So if we add another word in here, put large in again, then we should see the same token number appearing. And if these are unique tokens, it has to add a new number to the token list and track that so that it's there for the decode step later. Now, one of the things we can do through that process by tweaking it is, as I say, magnify or diminish features. So I've got some data here that is trying to predict whether text is talking about a cat or a dog. The input is some text, the cat is gray, the output is, in fact, this time a picture of a cat and so on. So we've got some, some uh, different bits of input. But I'm going to control this uh, a little bit more carefully by saying, instead of just going automatically for one of these, uh, these two automatic choices that it might make on my behalf, I'm going to go through three steps of encoding. I'm going to turn everything to uppercase, which means it'll no longer distinguish between uppercase and lowercase letters. I'll remove diacritics. That's things like umlauts and cedillas and accents. And then we'll do the segmented words, um, which is to break the thing up into words and effectively make them into tokens. Now, by doing that, when I've got my classifier function, this rather awkward piece of text should behave perfectly reasonably. So the fact that this is all in uppercase and so isn't a, a segmented word that it's ever seen before, but it has seen this mostly lowercase, they're the same thing now because of this to uppercase step. And this uh, O umlaut, so I guess this is a dug is uh, treated just like an O. And so we've managed to turn a richer data set into actually a simpler data set, giving me more data points because we have to explore fewer features because I'm stripping those features during the encoding step. Now, there's another key task that goes on in a fairly automated way of this encoding, which is something called dimension reduction. Now, if we take uh, net encode on image and do show all, you'll see that one problem you get is you get an awful lot of data sometimes. So here are, is the encoding of this image, which is uh, a list of 
matrices, each one the size of the dimensions of that image. So that was a pretty small image of maybe 100 pixels by 100 pixels, but that's already 30,000 data points for all of the red, green, blue values of all of those pixels. And fairly quickly, if you have a large data set of, of images to process, that becomes a very large data set to work with, and the processing times can become huge. So one of the things we want to do is to strip out key information. We don't want to just turn it into a vector. We want to turn it into a vector of things that matter. And this is true also when uh, you have uh, data on, uh, in high dimensional space of any kind that we might, for example, have data on people in our database and we want to predict their income. Now, it might be that the eye color has been recorded of the person, maybe for identification purposes, and it may be that your color of your eye has no impact on your income for predictive purposes. So we don't want to train on that. We want to identify that actually the things that seem to matter most are what job you are and what region you live in and how old you are, might be the top three predictors. And we want to try and throw out the information that isn't very predictive fairly early in the process. So the key thing here is to try and reduce the data set down to less data, but a data that's important. Now, really to kind of give an example of uh, the kind of process that goes on here, I've got, uh, I'm just generating some random data here related to a picture. I've got some x, y points, and, uh, and I can plot them uh, uh, on, on a graph here. And pose the question of, if I couldn't, if I didn't have enough room to store both x and y, which one would you keep? So we could throw out uh, the y values, and you can imagine all of these points being compressed down onto the axis. And in our worst points, there'd be like a point, some perhaps here, where we couldn't distinguish between all, any of these data points. Um, but we could distinguish all of those from these data points. Or we could throw out the x direction, and then you get the problem in this direction, where all of these data points across this entire length would become indistinguishable. So perhaps, in this case, the x is the more important to keep, and the y is the one that uh, should be discarded. But there are all kinds of clever maths out there to do better than that, because if we transform that data, and uh, here I'm using something called principal components, I can, in this case, rotate this data around so that now, when I throw out the y coordinate, I'm throwing away less information than when I threw it out before. Because now I've aligned the data so that as much of it is in, is in line with the x direction as possible. And this is a sort of one of the basic ideas of dimension reduction, is can we identify which of the dimensions matter most? Of course, that's the simplest case. The much more complicated case are you can't simply throw out one dimension or another, but there is actually uh, a relationship between dimensions that, um, that you can find a mapping for that still allows you to represent things as one number. So here I've taken some data and applied an algorithm to it to map it to the line on the right. And you can see that in most cases, and there's a few glitches where it goes wrong, we can turn that into one number where it's really not throwing much information out at all. As we go along the line, we're measuring how far along the line we are. So now our key piece of information is length along the curve. And our irrelevant piece of information is how far off the curve, which is very small amount of data we're throwing away because the deviation is quite small. Whereas we really get to express quite a lot by the length along the curve. So really, to put it in a more mathematical way, what we're trying to produce is a mapping from uh, m-dimensional space to an n-dimensional ma manifold, which preserves the most information, where hopefully n is a lot smaller than m. But that we don't have to worry about that. It, maths in much detail because, again, we have tools to automate this process. So let's look at those in a bit more detail. So the concept uh, behind feature extraction is a two-stage process. It's to take the data and do an encoding, so we can turn it into numbers, but then do dimension reduction on that in order to figure out what is the minimal vector that we can represent. Now, in this case, we haven't got very much data. So in fact, our feature extraction has ended up with a vector of three numbers, even though we were only put, putting two in, because that's uh, a way of, it's, it's needed to map this onto, uh, onto some tokens. And so we actually have a token membership has been one of the vectors. But when you have richer uh, data, when there is m either a lot more data, so you can start uh, doing reduction, or the data itself is very rich in the first place because it has lots of data points, then feature extraction will try and 
bring that down to a reasonable number of data points. So here I've made a feature extractor from a collection of cats and dogs. And uh, it's gone through the pictures and it's actually cheated a little bit. It's used a, a, a pre-built feature extractor trained on tens of thousands of images to know, to start off with, what are typical features that one looks for in an image. And then it's reduced that down given the experience it has to try and figure out, well, what are the features that seem to distinguish between these six pictures? And when we look at the, the now our vector that represents this cat, we've managed to reduce it down to just five numbers that somehow represent this in a fairly distinct way against these other pictures. Now, those might correspond uh, to something that we could relate to. They might be how uh, pointy its ears are would be one of the numbers, or how round its face is, or how textured the fur is, or something like that. But in practice, they're likely to be things that we can't conceive of, that there's some weird combination of, uh, of lines or angles or, or um, uh, sort of background texturing that, uh, that you wouldn't particularly recognize if you, if you saw it and wouldn't help you as a human to distinguish between cats and dogs. But as far as it's concerned, they seem to be predictive. So let's, uh, it's not going to do a very good job with a small amount of data, so I'm going to do something with a slightly large amount of data here. This is a little subset of the Stanford uh, dog database that I'm just going to import, and so it's going to be a, a collection of different breeds of dog. So here's the pictures. And I'm going to, uh, um, let's just look at a few of those. There's eight dogs taken at random. And I'm going to do a feature extraction on that with the hope of trying to be able to distinguish between different breeds. So with more data, we need a little bit more time, but there it is. And now we've got a feature extractor that we can apply to an unseen image. I'm going to give it a picture of this Basset Hound. And because it's got uh, now much more data to work with, its feature extractor is, uh, is producing a vector that's much, much larger. There's a lot of features it's looking at that gives it much more subtle control. Let's just ask it how many it found there. Uh, the length of that last vector was 59. So it's 59 dimensional space, and that point in that space is enough to represent the key things that seem to change between these three breeds of dog. So once we have this tool of being able to take a set of data and extract salient features, well, that's most of the work of the unsupervised learning that we talked about at the beginning. I haven't had to tell it anything about there being three breeds of dog or that they're even that they're pictures of dogs or anything about the images. There's been no human supervision. I've just said, here's some data, learn some features. And once we've got that feature extractor, we can start doing some useful things with this. So for example, I can take two images and decide how similar they are. Um, I can measure a feature distance. So if you imagine in two-dimensional space, this is just the distance across a page. It's the same thing in this 59-dimensional dog space that we've created. We're finding the distance across that, that space. And we can compare now with, uh, so this is with two Basset Hounds. If we now compare a Basset Hound and a Chihuahua, we find that the we find that the distance in this 59 space feature space uh, is is a lot greater. So we are able to start measuring the similarity between images that has been learned from the experience from the images. Once we have this concept of measuring uh, distances over feature spaces that have been learned from the data set, we have essentially solved the problem of unsupervised learning because all of those features were completely without human guidance. I didn't tell it that those were pictures of dogs or that there were three different breeds or uh, what features to look for, it learned that for itself. So all we need to do is to look now for items that are close to each other in the feature space and we can start inferring that they have some similarity in the real world. So, so that you can see what this looks like, I'm going to redo that on a forcing it down to two, two feature space that uh, I can use as xy coordinates in a plot. Um, in practice, we'll do better to keep all 59 uh, points uh, in, the, in the feature space it found. But here's what happens if I force it to go down to two. That once placed in that feature space, here are the, the two features, I don't know what they represent, whether it's uh, something about the, the color of the animals or the shape of the face or whatever, it's enough already we can see to distinguish the, between the different breeds that we can see in the bottom left corner, we seem to have most of the hounds. So we've got some basset hounds down here in the bottom left corner. Bottom right, all the chihuahuas have grouped together. And at the top, we've got all of the Labradors. And it's, you can even see that the black Labradors are being separated out slightly on the right-hand side from the, from the golden Labradors on the left-hand side.
So this is what cluster, class, cluster classifier is doing, but in a much richer high dimensional space. And this is where it becomes much more useful. I can say, take the dog images and the features that we found earlier and put them into three groups. And we can go through the images and say, what group does each of those images come in? And you see it's numbered them uh, one, two, and three. It's found some ones and threes in this first 20 images. It doesn't know what those are. It's still up to us as humans to look at that group and say, ah, group one, you've identified a breed of dog, and they appear to be, uh, appear to be basset hounds. Um, the system can't do that. But it can tell us uh, which things belong in which group. This classification task that we had earlier is now being done unsupervised. I've given it three pictures here, and it's told us that both of the first two are in the same class, class number one, and the, the third picture, the chihuahua, is in a different class, class number three. So you can imagine in, a, say, a medical context, you are screening uh, cells under a microscope. All it can tell you is that there are 10 different types of cell. And it's up to you as a human to go through after it's done the identification and say, OK, that's a blood cell and that's a skin cell. But, oh, there's a type of cell here that's identified that's different, but I don't understand why that's different and maybe worth further investigation. Maybe it's a cancerous cell and, and that's the, the feature that is the key thing that we're looking for. But it comes completely unsupervised until that after the training step.